Hello, and welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Mocock flavoured podcast. In this show, we return at last to the weird and war torn Europe of the tragic millennium as we conclude our deep dive into the Jewel in the Skull. We kicked off part one all the way back in November last year, picking up part two in February. Then Covid got in the way, Tash got stuck in Sri Lanka, and we've had to wait a good four months to pick it up again. Better late than never, though. In the meantime, I was lucky enough to play in Dirk the Dice's Hawkmoon RPG playing Agent of the Runestaff, the Banneret of Tanelon, who was surely an avatar of Gerard Arthur Connolly, a.k.a. Newton Ewell, a.k.a. Bob Sugarman. More on him next time. Anyway, the game was great, thoroughly more cocky and with just the right blend of weird fantasy and twisted technology, and the folks playing it made it great fun. It just so happens that last month's episode of The Grognard Files was all about the Hawkmoon role-playing game in its various guises. As I've said before, even if you're not a gamer, I heartily recommend that show for their insights into the source material. I'll link to their show in the blog post on breakfastintheruins.com. Last week's show, part two of The Eternal Champion, was our tenth episode proper, eleventh if you include the short introductory show, and I'm already itching to develop the format and freshen things up a little bit. I'm not talking new coke, but just something to add a little variety. More on that next time too. As you'll know if you're a regular listener, occasional co-host Laws and our pal Neil, who has helped me numerous times with audio considerations and advice, not least making part two of the Jewel in the Skull listenable, they used to have a band back in the day called Giant Kind. As Loz is a Mocock nerd, they even recorded a song called Breakfast in the Ruins. As it hasn't had much airplay over the years, I'm sticking it on the end of the show. As you probably know, but if you don't, I'll remind you, the intro and outro tunes are Giant Kind numbers, and I understand they're setting up a band camp page to put all of their tunes out for the digital generation, and old farts like me that lost their cassettes donkeys years ago. Anyway, back to Hawkmoon. As we progress into book three of The Jewel in the Skull, we're exposed to the variety in style and content that it is possible to find in the space of what are relatively short books, and this one is a classic example of Mocock's write a book in three days process from the late 60s, for both good and ill. So let's get into it. Our table is set, Tasha's ordered the tucker, she's brought the rum, and we've got stuff to digest. <laughs> Okay, and we are back in Derry and Tom's roof garden, and we have Natasha. Hello, Natasha. Hello. Yeah, you've got to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Just waving's fine. Fine for me. Um, I'm swallowing some fine rum there. You don't wash things. Well, like this that. is this is very true. Um, so, are you on the rum, or have you stuck with your? No. Disgraceful whiskey that I just Disgraceful tried. Disgraceful whiskey. I'll save that for later. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's a... Cheers. A tip of the glass to a uh, lovely, lovely diplomatic or is, is it the reserve? Yeah. Oh, God. Cool. Only the best. <laughs> Obviously. Mm. Mm. Right, lovely. So, of course, we should have been recording this um, round about early March, but then COVID happened and you got stuck in Sri Lanka with a hotel for your help, to yourself for five days. Which must have been a terrible hardship. Like the celebrity that I am. Yeah. But here we are, four months later, and we're finally getting round to hopefully conclude something that we actually kicked off back in November. No, nope. This is the book that never ends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? It does end. It and doesn't in end. some ways, thank fuck for that. <laughs> oh dear God, uh, let it end. Yeah, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll get into that for a short book. It did tend to overstay its <laughs> welcome by the end. There's just so much to understand within it. Clearly. Yeah. Um, I think for anybody who's listening, who um, <laughs> listened to our last episode, originally the first chapter that we're going to cover today was the last part of book two of The Jewel in the Skull. But for a variety of reasons, which you may be able to discern from listening to the last episode, we never quite got to, to that last chapter. And I think in a way it's a good thing because I'm glad we started with this chapter because it's really, really good. And then we'll discuss how it goes after that. Had we just done book three on its own, I think it might have been quite a miserable experience. And short. And which, short. And very short. Something like that. But actually, we're, there's some spoilers there. It's, oh. it's a, certainly how I feel about uh, book three of The Jewel in the Skull. You may feel completely differently. Well, do you know what? A couple of ones. I'm sure we can string out for yeah, the three I'm sure hours. We can. So, just as a quick recap, where have we been? Well, we were introduced to, to Count Brass, and um, we. Later found out that the evil moustache twirling Baron Melidas wanted to run away with the Baron's daughter. This is really summarising things ridiculously. Then later on, the Duke of Colne, Hawkmoon, the man of great personality and erudition, is brought to Londra where he has uh, been imprisoned after rebelling and Melidas wants to use him to 
trick the count and get the Kamarg and get the hand, well, not the hand, the body and everything of the count's daughter, Yiselda, because he's a moustache twirling villain. Of oh, I do kind of love Baron Malidus. And one of, one of my disappointments with this is we don't really get any great Baron Malidus... Um, sleazy moments. Sleazy moments, which is a real shame. But we'll, we'll get down into that anyway. So where we left it last off, Hawk Moon had had a black jewel put in his skull, which was slowly eating his brain, and he'd been sent to the Kamarg in disguise as Baron Malidus to, uh, to get in there and get up to no good. But... Because the Count is wise and Bo Gentle, his philosopher, is also a smarty pants. They used a whole series of beat poems, which they threw down during a, a, some kind of banquet and interrupted the activity of the Jew and the Skull, which was a visual-only observation device, which couldn't actually capture audio. We commented on how that was a little bit lame, but we got, eventually got away with it. So now we're at the point where Hawk Moon is temporarily recovering from his uh, trauma-induced mental illness with the help of the Count's daughter, Yiselda, and walking around in the gardens being all lovey-dovey, which is really nice. And they're preparing for an inevitable attack from the Grand Britannians. Oh, all action. So, just to so everybody knows, we are working from our Mayflower editions of The Jewel in the Skull. Tash's is in miles better condition than mine. And I've got to say... With some horror, I've just read a comment on an Instagram post that I put on with the cover of this book and uh, and the booze we were drinking, and somebody commented that the art was terrible, and obviously the artist has never read the contents. Now, whether that's the case or not, I'm not going to argue, but this is not a terrible cover, and anybody who doesn't dig Mayflower covers, you know what, I don't want to know them. I don't want to know them. We had an entertaining conversation for me about the the cover of the Eternal Champion, because it's some weird kind of red Vishnu figure with what looks like Nicole Kidman with a builder's bum right. draped over him. There's no resemblance whatsoever to the contents of the book, but it doesn't matter, because it's ace. It's a fantastic cover. So we're working from the Mayflower editions. I will point out that due to something that pops up later on in book three, I did check with the Golanx Master Collection edition from about four or five years ago. Because what we've found is Mocock has revised the text of these books so many times and there was something I wanted to check, which we'll look at later, to see whether he'd revised it. And all he'd done was decapitalise a word. And that was the only change, but we'll get to that when we get to it. How long did it take you to find that? Um, well, fairly quickly, because I did my reading this morning and I read this bit, this passage, which I thought, hmm, not entirely convinced by that. I wonder if he revised it for later editions. So I hopped upstairs, pulled off my... Um, Got Lanks edition, checked it out, and no, other than decapitalising, he hadn't changed it in any way, which was interesting. Slightly disappointing. But anyway, we'll get to that. So, story-wise, two months have passed, and Count Brass is in a circle, a plan in the defence of the Camargue against the inevitable attack from Malidus, who must, to be fair, be hopping mad now, because he's given Hawk Moon his best. Keanu Reeves in Much Ado About Nothing, black leather outfit, and, uh, and it's not worked. It's not worked. He's no longer got the, the tap into the jewel in the skull, so he doesn't know what's going on. So he must be really, really cheesed off. I'm kind of unhappy that we don't have a scene with Malidus expressing that, but we'll just have to suck that up. So they observe that, and usually for Grand Bretagne, they'll be striking through unfamiliar, unconquered territory to attack the Camargue, leaving their flanks vulnerable. It's very unusual for Grand Bretagne, because normally, even though they're horrible, they're pretty conservative in their tactics and they overwhelm people by force and weird weapons. Now, Hawkman's finally coming out of himself a bit now, because he's got maps and battle tactics to play with, which any good boy, surely that should bring him out a little bit. And Von Villa can count brass. Um, when he reveals his plan to gather 200 of the Camargue's best horsemen and harry and attack the Grand Bretagne flanks to try and drive them to a position of their choosing to defend the Camargue, well, I think, I think Von Villa can count brass get burners at that point. They're, they're pretty impressed with this, this manliness and the fact that he's coming out of himself and coming up with this funky plan. And of course, the position they choose to defend is where they've got all their funky weird science towers. So, makes sense. But when he's not planning, he hangs out with Yiselda. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to really, really enjoy all of these. Um, the eternal champion considers his situation in repose with the latest hot babe. Because there's a lot of that in the eternal champion novel and we get some more of it here. So... Next day, Dorian Hawkman went riding across the wild marshland, the Lady Yiselda at his side. They had spent much time together since his recovery, and he was deeply attached to her, 
they seemed to show her little attention. Content enough to be near him, (laughs) she was yet sometimes piqued that he made no demonstration of affection. She did not know that he wanted nothing more than to do so, but he felt a responsibility toward her that made him control his natural desire to court her. For he knew that any moment of the night or day, he might become, in the space of a few minutes, a mindless, shambling creature bereft of his humanity. He lived constantly in the knowledge that the Black Jewel's power could burst the bonds Count Brass had cast around it, and that shortly afterwards the Lords of Grand Britain would give the Jewel its full life, and it would eat his mind. So he did not tell her that he loved her, and that this love had first stirred his inner mind from its slumber, and that because he saw this, Count Brass had spared his life. And she was, for her part, too shy to tell him of her love. <laughs> At this point. At this point. So, what do you make of that? Is it because he, he thinks that he's protective of her, or is it because he thinks Count Brass will clear him in twain? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> if he old, does anything dodgy. It's the old Buffy Angel um, dilemma, isn't it? Oh, you have to explain that to me, because... Do you not watch the Buffy I'm not a Buffy thing? Angel guy. I was that age at that time. Yeah. I don't own the DVDs, and we don't do it every Saturday. Yeah. You? Um, but yeah, I think like the probably all seven seasons in the whole of Angel was probably about Angel had a soul because he was cursed. Mm. So he was a vampire with a soul, but if he fell in love, then he'd lose his soul and turn back into a vampire. Uh-huh. Almost directly lifted, no doubt, from Mr. Moorcock. Mm. Um, you've got to put in some dramatic tension somewhere, haven't you? I suppose so. Um, Especially I'd... in a book this short, given yeah. what we know to happen about 12 pages on. Or yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to um, come across trend when it comes to characterisation of princesses stroke counts daughters and their relationships with the Eternal Champion or whatever avatar of the Eternal Champion we're talking at the moment. So I, th- I think we commented in, in the last episode that basically any twat who walks through the door with a sword and a nice swish suit of armour, she's all over him like a rash. Because she fell for Malidas pretty quickly. And she's falling for uh, Hawkman as well. That this village dude, life though, isn't it? Yeah, this dude who turned up and was completely flat and emotionless with a massive jewel in the middle of his skull. But he was dressed in swish armour. And he's probably hot. So, fair game. Fair game. Fair game, they've got to go for it. I was a little bit mortified since then when you suggested that Moorcock himself may actually have heard these um, podcasts um, because I might not have been entirely flattering about the character development of um, Yiselda or, in fact, other women. Well, I I know for a fact that he listened to the first episode of The Dreaming City and I know that he listened to the birthday episode because he wished Phil a happy birthday in a context mentioned certain things that he must have listened to the episode. Beyond that... I don't know. Well, one would hope not, but if so, we apologise. Yeah. Um, we, we are absolutely armchair critiquing, and I personally have written nothing for publishing, publication yeah. in my life. Um, and if I did, it'd probably be shit, at which point somebody else would sit home going, that was shit. Yeah. And we've got to go back to the fact that we've t- talked previously about the fact he, he wrote this in three days, probably on a shitload of speed. Um, he typed up notes, passed it to his mate behind him, then they went to the publisher, and they were basically published as written. We will leave our verdict open as to whether that begins to show. <laughs> <laughs> we all have a good days. <laughs> yeah. I think we might we may have said something a little bit more direct than that, yeah. Andrew, in previous. Yeah, well let's when we get there we can we can make a decision as to how direct we want to be. Right. So anyway, that's that nice little sweet interlude. We then cut to Hawk Moon with his armed men out on the range, wrecking and spying on the enemy. It was like a vast legion out of hell moving slowly southward, battalion upon battalion of marching infantry, squadron after squadron of cavalry, every man masked so that it seemed that the entire animal kingdom marched against the Camarg. Tall banners sprouted from this throng, and metal standards swayed on long poles. There was the banner of, deep breath, Azravak Mikozavar, with its grinning sword-wielding corpse on whose shoulder a vulture perched, beneath it were stitched the words, Death to Life. The tiny figure swaggering in his saddle close to this standard must be Azravak Mikozavar. Oh, fuck. Azravak Mikozavar himself. <laughs> Next to Baron Malidas, he was the most ruthless of all the warlords of Grand Bretagne. Nearby was the cat standard of Duke Vendel, Grand Constable of that order. The fly banner of Lord Jarak Nankinsine, and a hundred other similar flags of a hundred other orders. Even the Mantis banner was there, though the Grand Constable was absent. He was the King Emperor Huon but in the foremost rode the wolf-masked figure of Melidas, carrying his own standard, the snarling figure of a rampant wolf, even his horse caparisoned all in armour, with fancifully wrought chamfron, 
resembling the head of a gigantic wolf. So they found the army. Hartman's seen all this before, of course, but he's more interested in their course along the river with their supply barges packed side by side and end to end. And this is where his cunning plan comes into play, which is to cause chaos. So they head down river and bugger about collapsing an old bridge and water course to divert the course of the river and knacker up Miletus' planned route. And it, it does, um, I think it, it bears some consideration as to um, how easily a massive Grand Britannian army might end up getting screwed up by some issues regarding traffic. You know what? Let's find out. Let's see if their heritage shows through. So the next day, this causes absolute chaos as they display their full and tragic inability to cope with traffic snafus and everything grounds to an enormous halt because, of course, no matter how you re-describe them, the British just cannot cope with fucked up traffic. The river was now a morass of dark mud and in it, like so many stranded whales, lay the battle badges of Grand Bretagne, some with prows jutting high and sterns buried deep in the stuff of the riverbed, some on the sides, some bow first in the mud, some upside down, War engines scattered, livestock in panic, provisions ruined, and wading among all this, the soldiers attempted to haul the budded crusted barges to land. Free horses from their entangling ropes and straps, and rescue sheep, pigs, and cows that struggled wildly in the morass. Seems like a normal day down the M62, isn't it? Pretty much. Bit of bad weather down the M62, that's First pretty much what happened. of snow. Yeah. Um, so this, this gives Hartwell his opportunity, and that night his mounted warband quietly infiltrate the camp and cause a little bit of chaos. And this this is a this whole sneak into the camp at night thing has become quite a, a staple of these kind of things, hasn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. I think it was definitely in an episode of the Game of, Th- Game of, Th- the Game of Thrones. Wrong, um, wrong person here. You were a Gamma person, weren't you? No. No? It's Eddings. I've uh, read some Eddings. I didn't say he was, you know. You're not no. an Eddings person. I'm not an Eddings person. But I tried Gamma and couldn't get on with Gamma. Yeah, well, funnily enough, um, I keep getting recommended Gemma oh, don't. by people on Twitter. I'm trying. Bless them. And I think I've tried Legend three times. Oh, don't. Just get, give up. It's, it's just not working for me. Oh. Yeah, I don't know why. Probably because there aren't any awkwardly drawn female princesses who swoon at the sign. There's First sign of a hero. A few pages more than 120. Yeah, there is. That is true. Very quiet. Well, you're reading from the book. Yeah. I'm like, it's like story time here. We just ate. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, Jack and Ori, excellent. Yeah. Uh, right, well, let's have another read then. So they're piling around, knocking over tents. It says, at last, his sword glistening with blood. Hawkman fought his way to the centre of this circle, and there stood what he sought, the proud mantis banner of the order of which the King Emperor himself was grand constable. A band of warriors stood around it, pulling on helmets and adjusting the shields on their arms. Probably still in the jammers, I reckon, which is a bit unfortunate of him. Without waiting to see if his men followed, Hartman thundered towards them with a wild yell. A shiver ran up his arm as his sword clanged against the shield of the nearest warrior, but he lifted it again, and the sword split the shield, gashing the face of the man behind it so that he reeled back, spitting blood from his ruined mouth. Another Hartman took in the side, and another's head was shorn off clean. His blade rose and fell like some relentless machine, and now his men joined him, pressing the warriors farther and farther back into a tighter and tighter ring around the Mantis banner. So I think at this point, Murcock's probably at the end of day two in his writing. Yeah. He's writing full-blooded battle, and th- this, these are some of my favourite battle passages that I loved as a 14-year-old. There's something that's always thoroughly entertaining and visceral about the idea of a ruined mouth <laughs> <laughs> due to a sword blow and people spitting teeth, spinning round and spitting teeth. You, you, you can't beat a bit of that, can you? Oh, but, can you? Can you? Mm. Well, again, back to his great writing ability. Mm. It's actually a few pages mm. where, and as we know, across the genre, you could go a whole chapter of them crossing a battlefield. Mm. But he also conveys both the strategy and the detail. Yeah. As you say, gives you a visceral experience of the battle. Yeah. So for me, when I read these, especially when you get the, oh, he's a whole chapter of them, you know, sword fighting, and only power. He's left, oh, did he? That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, I tend to skim read it um, but with this one there's not enough to skim read no. and that's it and, and again it, that's his that's his gift isn't it yeah it's when, like, it, when it's on form it's a skim description of a, of a, uh, a scrap yeah that's super vivid and, and um, helps you realise a vision of what's going on and we get a little bit more of that when he gets into a, a fight further on but right now he's, he's, he's in that zone 
where he's rattling this stuff on a typewriter and he's, he's in his, in the middle of his, I don't know, whatever is fueling his fugue state. He's right there in the middle of it and, and this stuff is just flying off his typewriter. And this whole chapter is really fantastic in terms of mood and action and everything. He's a great action writer. He's a good fantasy writer. He's a good science fiction writer. But like it or not, and I don't know whether he likes it or not, I'm sure he takes some pride in it. He's a really fucking good action writer. When it, when it comes down to it. I wonder, I mean, I hope, again, he doesn't listen to any more of our podcasts, but I do wonder if he heard it, he'd be sitting there going, you've no idea that book took me six months. I had the worst, worst <laughs> mental block. I couldn't think of the next word. You're tossing it off. I tried all the drugs, nothing worked. But it would be interesting. Yeah. And it's definitely well recorded um, in, in interview after interview where he does explain that, these these books were basically tossed off. He, he was he was probably took his typewriter to the bog, and probably didn't bathe or anything like that. Um, even the Folio Society uh, were on Twitter a couple of weeks ago talking about it because the Folio Society apparently have have some mocock on their list of things to publish. Mm-hmm. If there was ever a Folio Society mocock edition, I'll be all over it like a rash. So anyway, by this point, the Black Jewel's been spotted by some of the Grand Britannian warriors and so has been busted, so they know exactly who it is. So he starts charging around again, shouting, Hawk Moon, Hawk Moon. And uh, they decide that discretion is the better part of valor at this point and piss off back to their secret hideaway cave, realising that Melidas will have the engineers probably attempts to undam the river again, which they expect. So they leap into action again the next day and there's lots more scrapping, lots more furious Mokok action. It's vivid, it's exciting, it's visceral, and there's a big scrap at the dam. Hawkmoon's horse, protected by chain armor, staggered as a huge man swung a double-bladed war axe at it. The horse fell, dragging Hawkmoon with it, its body trapping him. The vulture-faced axe man moved in, raising the weapon over Hawkmoon's face. Hawkmoon pulled his arm from beneath the horse and there was a sword in his hand that swept up just in time to take the main force of the blow. The horse was clambering to its feet again. Hawkmoon sprang up and grabbed its reins, while at the same time protecting himself from the swinging axe. Once, twice, thrice the weapons met until Hawkmoon's sword arm ached. Then he slid his blade down the shaft and struck the axeman's fists. Hawkmoon's adversary let go of the weapon with one hand and a muffled oath coming from within the mask. Hawkmoon smashed his sword against the metal mask, denting it. The man groaned and staggered. Hawkmoon got both hands on the grip of the broadsword and brought the blade around to chop deep into the head again. The vulture mask split and a bloodied face was revealed, the bearded mouth screaming for mercy. Hawkman's eyes narrowed, for he loathed the mercenaries more than he loathed the Grand Britannians. He delivered a third blow to the head, staving in all of one side, so that the man waltzed backwards, already dead, and crumpled against one of his fellows who was engaged with the Camargian horseman. Once again, really good writing of nasty fighting, but we've got to call him out as a bit of a hypocrite here, because we know from the last one that he served as a Grand Britannian mercenary for about a year. How does he know that this guy isn't doing it for the same reasons he did? Bloody hypocrite. So this, anyway, this continues for a few days and there's lots and lots of descriptions of, of more scrapping. But by this point on my reread, I'm impatient for some Malidus by now. I want some Malidus action. I want to know what he's thinking. I want that narrative switch of perspective. Sadly, we don't get it, which is a bit disappointing. And after four more failed attempts to dismantle the damn Malidus, finally just goes there himself and spots Hawkmoon. And they do actually have a, a brief exchange, which is slightly Malidus-y, but a little bit a little bit disappointing. My thanks, Baramelidus, said Hartman. The nurturing you gave me in Londra seems to have improved my strength. Oh, Hartmoon, Melidus replied, his voice soft but shrieked, shaking with rage. I know not how you escaped the power of the Black Jewel, but you will suffer a fate many thousand times greater than the one you have avoided when I take the Kamag and once again make you my prisoner. And anyway... Loads of other people turn up and they're, they're part ways and bugger off again. So, yeah, slightly disappointed that I have a bit more of uh, an entertaining exchange because, sadly, for the rest of the book, Melidus doesn't really get any good dialogue. And there was loads of good dialogue in the other parts. Arguably, there's not a lot of good dialogue for the rest of the book. Well, yeah, yes. there is that. So, more wolves arrive, so they piss off. Uh, job done, Hartmon and Gang return back to Castle Brass. And a day or two later, Melidus and his army arrived at the planned spot that they've driven into. And after a brief parley, when Count Brassberg <laughs> sends them packing, and they turn up and uh, Melidus doesn't speak, does he? And his, his, uh, his herald says, oh, we'll leave the castle. We'll let you all go. We'll let you all live. And Count Brass goes, fuck off. And I beat Melidus in a fight once. I can beat him again and sends him off with a tail between his legs. 
So finally, several pages into the chapter called The Battle of the Camargue, we actually get The Battle of the Camargue. Oh, good Lord. And what does it kick off with? Giant flamingos versus ornithopters. Um, we have psychedelic tower weapons and some sweaty mano, uh, mano action. Hartman can see Malidus supervising the battle from a distance, so he gets stuck in. Hartman saw Malidus some distance in the rear and recognised the barbaric vulture mask of Azrovac Mikozovar as the huge Muscovian led his vulture legion on foot and was one of the first to cross the swamp and reach the slopes of the hill. Hartman trotted his horse forward a little so that he would be directly in the path of Mikozovar when he approached. He heard a bellow and the vulture mask glared at him with eyes of ruby. Aha, Hawk Moon, the dog that has worried at us for so long. Now let's see how you conduct yourself in a fair fight, traitor. Call me not traitor, Hawk Moon said angrily. You sniffer of corpses. Because of our hefted his great war axe in his arm and hands. Bellowed again and began to run towards Hawk Moon, who jumped from his horse and with shield and broadsword prepared to defend himself. Now, I'm not going to read this all out because I love that Mocock can describe an epic violent sea battle in a page and bring it vividly to life. But here we get a page, maybe a page and a half, on Hawkman versus Mikozovar. And he actually goes into a little bit more detail about this man and man encounter. And it's fucking great. It's cinematic, it's sweaty, it's bloody, it's violent. And again, I'm reminded reading this of why I love this as a 14-year-old. Where at the time, every other book I was reading was probably a Sven Hassel novel. So all that, all that gritty, horrible violence, I was, I was super, super into it. You know, no no real spoilers, but he defeats Mikhozovar, of course, and looks over and von Vil- old von Villach is uh, is having his own fight with Michael Holst, another one of these constables, and, and he defeats him. And the Grand Britannia army, horrified now at this turn of events and in disarray, they actually start to uh, to break down. Hawkmoon thought he heard a great scream of rage rise from the retreating army, thought he recognised the vengeful sound as that of Malidus, and he smiled. We shall see Malidus again in some way, he said. Count Brass nodded in agreement. Actually, as it happens, we, we just seem to bump into fucking Malidus every 30 seconds after this point, which is a, something of a disappointment. So back at Castle Brass, they chill out and contemplate the victory. Bow Gentle advises caution. The Grand Britannia are insane and will, will act in ways that aren't conventional. And Hartman tells you, Zelda, he's off to find Malagigi, the sorcerer scientist in Persia, to sort up the Black Jewel, and they finally cop a snog. Finally, it took a while, but they get there. So that was the end of book two of The Jewel in the Skull. So a nice, big, climactic battle, lots of action. And with book three, well, it's, let's say it's, it's a tonal shift, it's probably fair to say. Calm down. Hmm. And, and what we seem to do here is we head into old school Mocock quest mode, which means that the protagonist must go somewhere to get this, to go somewhere else to do that in order to achieve some kind of goal. There's often some kind of MacGuffin. The Coran books fall really badly into this um, at certain points, but this is the first time we get it in Hartman. And I don't know how long it is since you've read The Mad God's Amulet and The Sword of the Dawn, but it's something that continues for about another 270-odd pages from memory. That's pretty much a running theme of many fantasy books, though, isn't it? It's like, yeah. oh, at the start, we need one of these, great. Where is it? Oh, it's over there. Yeah. Three of us and you. Let's go. Yeah. And they travel and they get it. And then yeah. it's like, ah, oh, shit, we need one of these. Yeah. Book two. Yeah. Travelogue. Encounter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Get the treasure. Get the magic item. Travelogue. Another encounter. Use magic item. Achieve yeah. something. Need another magic item. Yeah. Something comes out of left field. Side quest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Yeah. A lot of that going on. So, he, he heads south. There isn't, actually, there is an argument here. If you weren't to write this in three days and you were to maybe kind of write this in a more considered manner and, and oh. map out plot points, should the Battle of the Camargue been the end of the novel? In terms of story dynamics... Yeah, we put a loop and went, I need more words. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. That's kind of the impression you get for yeah. the next... Because you knew where it was going. It's like, yeah. right, how many words makes a book? I, th- I think it's definitely the case that... Where I to um, offer any kind of advice to 80-year-old author of 150 <laughs> novels, Michael Mocha. Who's sitting there wondering what yeah. you're thinking, what he should yeah. do. It yeah. would be, for fuck's sake, make that the climax and spare us, <laughs> spare us the, the, the 
trouble in piffle. <laughs> Put it into and the next three. one. Yeah. Put it into the next one. But anyway, Hawkmoon heads south on a, on a flamingo, yeah. crossing mountains before he gets shot down by arrows. And, uh, and he awakes in a cave. His face was struck by the heat from a great bonfire a short distance away. Over it, a spit had been constructed, and on the spit turned the huge carcass of the flamingo, trussed, plucked, and bereft of head and claws. Turning the spit by means of a complicated arrangement of leather thongs, which were dampened from time to time, was the stocky figure of a man almost half Hawkmoon's size. As Hawkmoon approached, the little man turned, yelled when he saw the blade in Hawkmoon's hand, and jumped away from the fire. The Duke of Colne was astonished. The little man's face was covered with fine reddish hair, and thicker fur of the same colour seemed to cover his body. He was dressed in a leather jerkin and a leather divided kilt, supported by a wide belt. On his feet were boots of soft doe skin, and he wore a cap into which were stuck four or five of the finest flamingo feathers, doubtless purloined from the bird's plumage during the plucking. So, it turns out this fella, Oladan, is the archetypal companion to champions that we get in all Michael Mocock novels, where he might as well just pop out of a bush and say, hello, I will be your companion from here on in. But we do get a little bit of description that, you know, Hawkmoon kind of likes him and immediately confides in him. So poor Oladan has just shot this guy down, now finds himself in a cave having to share his meal with this dude who's telling him his fucking life story, which, you know, he probably didn't deserve, but he's, he's a good-natured sort, so he takes it all on board. And Oladan offers to replace his mount. Something that can fly? asks Hawkmoon. Sadly, no. A goat's the beast I had in mind. Before Hawkman could speak, Oladan continued. I have a certain influence in these mountains, being regarded as something of curiosity. I'm a crossbred animal, you see, the result of a union between an adventurous youth of peculiar tastes, a sorcerer of sorts, and a mountain giantess. Alas, I am an orphan now, for mother ate father one hard winter, then mother was eaten in turn by my uncle Barkios, the terror of these parts, largest and fiercest of the mountain giants. Since then, I've lived alone with only my poor father's books for company. I am an outcast, too strange to be accepted either by my father's race or by my mother's, living on my wits. If I were not so small, doubtless, I should have been eaten also by Uncle Barkios by now. Which is a nice little story. I like the story, yeah. although that's virtually the last thing and all he says yeah. for the entire book. Yeah, other than, here, Hartmoon, take this. Or something. Yes. Um, or something similar. It's, he he uh, may as well be a black female in a white romantic comedy. Yeah. Um, if if we, we should really try and create some kind of Bechdel test. Yes. That applies to Hartmoon Companions. I mean, yeah. th- these books would all fail the Bechdel test, wouldn't they? Absolutely. By several magnitudes. I, mean, I suppose it does turn out vaguely useful when brigands show up and he casts a sleep spell on the leader, which is a, a nice classic bit of D&D action. And then they escape on pony-sized goats. So a bit, a bit of a tonal shift from what's gone before, with all this talk of ruined mouths and rending people's heads and smashing people's faces in. Their head chills out a bit. Yeah. They have a nice meal. It always like a good fantasy story when they sit down and have a nice meal of flamingo. Yeah, I think there, there is a point where he, he mentions that he shoves a giant drumstick towards Hawkmoon. And yeah, my 14-year-old self could also identify with, with that sitting in a cave with a fire with a little fairy block feeding me giant drumsticks. I could go there. That's, that's partially, you know, m- matches the male power fantasy archetype. Fuck but it. I think we've said, probably said, I can't remember most of our conversations, but I'm pretty sure we've said before, you do get the odd meal, but you don't get every fucking meal, which is, you know, there's, a, there's an amount of meals. That's yeah. the right amount of meals yeah. in fantasy. Yeah, and, and he nails it. Punctuate my stories with occasional <laughs> occasional giant haunches of, of, of something. Yeah, don't make it the food and wine show. Yeah, yeah. Plus jewel finding. Yeah. Even as a child, there was something about depictions of um, roast meat that always made me happy. Did you ever read Asterix books? Remember when they yes. always ended with a, with a banquet with, yes. with roast bars on plates? Yes. As a child, I would salivate at those pages, which probably explains why I'm the size I am. <laughs> Um, I'm very easily pleased when it comes to depictions of a roast meat. So chapter 12, the caravan of Agonosvos. Good Lord. So travel log time again for a page or two as they, uh, as they begin to travel through some rainy forests. The jewel begins to gnaw away at Hartman's head again and they come across a colourful caravan full of wildly diverse people and creatures, all of whom look thoroughly downtrodden and miserable, it's fair to say. And it turns out for some reason... Hartman suspects he knows the bloke in charge, an ancient exile from Colne who was 
banished 900 years ago. This is all incredibly convenient, <laughs> isn't it? Isn't it? Um, but to cut a long story short, this world. is basically a D and D encounter. Uh, this is a totally a D and D encounter. The encounter with caravan turns out the head of the caravan is a villain. They get captured. They escape with a map, some horses, and some other miscellaneous booty, and they um, get away from this villain who turns out to be some kind of hideously disfigured guy who wants to pull his helmet off. After all that's gone before, it's, it, it's a bit simplistic and a bit rubbish and a bit a bit Doctor Who cliffhanger. <laughs> um, oh no, we've been captured, but it's all right, we've escaped again. But I suppose it's, it's necessary to move things on so we can get to chapter three. Oh, it's the warrior on Jet and Gold again. Woo-hoo. Oh, not this guy. So again, we cut to Hawkmoon and Aladan. They've made significant progress. They've left out the travelogue for us and they're now at sea chatting to a finely apparelled captain. I've got to say, I'm quite jealous of this captain's garb. This is your current self or your 14-year-old self? This is my current self, yeah. The heavy Tarkian merchantman clove through the calm waters of the ocean, foam breaking over its bow. Its single latine sail stretched like a bird's wing as it took that strong wind. The captain of the vessel, in gold-tasseled hat and braided jacket, his long skirts held to his ankles by bands of gold, stood with Hawkmoon and Oladan in the stern of the ship. The captain jerked his thumb at the two huge blue horses corralled on the lower deck. Fine beasts, masters. I've never seen the like in these parts. He scratched its pointed beard. You would not sell them? I'm part owner of this vessel and could afford a good price. Hartman shook his head. These horses are worth more to me than any riches. I can believe it, replied the captain, missing his meaning. He looked up as the man in the top mast yelled and waved, stretching his arms to the west. And they spot some dark empire ships. So it turns out we find out that the Grand Britannians are down here as well, which in what I'm assuming is probably the Mediterranean or something, um, as they head to Persia. The dock head east, avoiding groups of troops commanded by compliments of Grand Britannians, but nevertheless they get jumped. And this really does feel like his speed's worn off by this point. Whatever is power in him has totally worn off, because the last chapter was, um, here's something, we get captured, we escape, we grab some items, we grab a map. Here's, we're at sea. We, we land, we meet some bad guys, we're just about to get captured. Warrior and Jet and Gold turns up, saves the day, deus ex machina style. And the Warrior and Jet and Gold, okay, is, is glimpsed in before. I don't get the point of the Warrior and Jet and Gold, particularly at this point. It's the um, Doctor Who plot device TM set up, yeah. isn't it? I remember exactly how I felt this morning when he reminded me how far we got last time. Yeah. And I knew I had to read this bit over again. Just for the third time this year, and this is exactly why. But I did find it does, and this is exactly what I remember from pretty much reading them back to back as a teenager. It does lend itself to speed reading quite well, and, yeah. uh, and it brings it back to that, um, you know, penny publishing kind of easy read, kind of accessible pop literature. Yeah, and I think that's part of the frustration of Murcock, isn't it? When you, when within the same book, you've got his best and his worst. <laughs> Well, it can't all be his best. Sometimes within a very, very short space of each <laughs> other. So, Parkman turned to where the warrior jet and gold sat his horse silently. I thank you, my lord, he said. You have followed me a long way. He resheathed his sword. Longer than you know, Dorian Hartman, came the rich, echoing voice of the warrior. You ride to Hamadan? Aye, to seek the sorcerer Malagigi. Good. I'll ride with you some of the way. It's not far now. Who are you? Hartman asked. Who may I thank? I am the warrior in jet and gold. Do not thank me for saving your life. You do not realise yet what I have saved it for. Come. And the warrior led them away from the lake. Uh, okay. Okay, fine. Be all mysterious. A week later, they arrive at Hamadan, and the warrior in jet and gold buggers off again, being all mysterious. He's like, oh, I'll, uh, I'll leave you now. So Hamadan is being rent by battle, Grand Britannians, locals, bat monsters, it's chaos, there's a hot babe in a chariot, tells him why and what's going on, She she's fighting against her brother for control and he's in bed with the Grand Britannians. So Hawkman and Aldam, they have a bit of a fight, a particularly uninspired fight. Then they find Malagigi's house and hammer on the gate, and okay, here we go. Now this is what I checked earlier on to see if he'd revised this for later editions. At last the gate swung open, and four huge negroes armed with pikes and dressed in purple robes barred the way. Hawkman saw a courtyard behind them. He tried to ride forward, but the pikes menaced him immediately. What business have you with our master, Malagigi? 
one of the Negroes asked. Now, the only thing has changed here is in this, Negroes is capitalised. <laughs> and in the McGollant's collection from 2008 or 9 or whatever, or 12, um, it's decapitalised. Now, it, it, it does make you wonder what the thought process was there to go back and address this piece of text, and the only thing potentially you do is decapitalise it. Did he do it or did some, you know... No idea. But edit to do it. The, the, the Golanx Master Collection claims that it's the other definitive texts reviewed and revised by Mocock himself. Now, that's not particularly unusual to come across in old science fiction and sword and sorcery and fantasy, but it's quite jarring when you read it again for the first time in 25 years. I think in, in Elric, it, it would have been... It was huge eunuchs. Right. So he swapped out eunuchs for Negroes. And this old geezer basically tells him to fuck off because he wants nothing to do with the war. He says, I'm going to play no part in your internal warring. So Melidas turns up again. Of course. Small world. Yeah, so Melidas turns up. They exchange a couple of words. Not enough for you. Yeah, and then, um, and then they just bugger off again because there's too many of them. So they bugger off back to the hills. And the warrior in Jet and Gold, who mysteriously disappeared only about two pages ago, is up there hanging out with the hot chariot queen. I must go now, Hawkmoon. I've got to talk to this chick on a hill 200 yards away. It dispels a little bit of the mystery, doesn't it? It really well, does. It really is that small. Yeah. So it turns out she's Queen Frabra. Another the... well-rounded female character. Yeah. It gets better. Um, <laughs> very shortly, it gets even better. Uh, so... A soldier comes from the town and says, Melidas has now captured Malagigi. This, this really is... This is how a, a dungeon master would try and progress the plot when the players were fucking it up really, <laughs> really badly. The players have, got, have gone to the gates of his house, they've rolled charm on the four huge Negroes, failed, buggered off, thought, what do we do now? So the, so the dungeon master goes, oh, for fuck's sake. I'll have something happen that, that progresses the plot. I am... Um... No plan survives contact with the enemy, does it? No. I think we discussed, because I did the live roleplay yeah. laser quest. <laughs> yeah. um, and and they, 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 they would craft these amazing scripts, and it made yeah. perfect, absolutely perfect sense Friday night to Sunday lunchtime. Um, <laughs> by about, it would start about half seven on a Friday night. By half eight, nine o'clock, we were writing everything, because we put the players in the obvious device plot TM set up. Yeah. Um, you know, you need to find this, you broke down a ship, blah, 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 set it in something that you gave in the background. They've spent weeks researching the characters, deciding what they're doing. Yeah. I always monstered because I'm not that weird. Yeah. Like, so I don't mind like running at people, but I can't be bothered to, like, you know, like, be weird. Um, by about an hour in, the, the script had gone out the window, the plot had gone out the window, what they knew they had to do had gone out the window, and they were all suspecting each other. And they were like still still sat in places, which is why I was like, you know, get a monster, go in and tell them they need to do that. How are we going to get them to here? What do we need to set on fire? Yeah. Go and get... We had, they had to ban fireworks, because there was an incident. There was an incident. Um, let's just say there was an incident. But um, yeah, people had to be... Cajoled is not, but yes, it, and I think that's probably why it appeals to people like us because we know exactly, yeah. you know, we recognize the plot, we understand where it comes from. He almost identifies himself as one of us at this point. Yeah, well, <laughs> I made a note of the next bit, and then um, Hawk Moon addresses uh, Queen, what's her name? Frog Does Rose. it matter? Yeah, the, the hot chariot queen, he addresses yeah. the hot chariot queen's uh, men. It says, a little later, Hawkman stood in the chariot and addressed the battle-weary warriors. Men of Hamadan, I have travelled many hundreds of miles from the west, where Grand Britain holds sway. My own father was tortured to death by the same Baron Melidas who aids your queen's enemies today. I have seen whole nations reduced to ashes, their populations slain or enslaved. I have seen children crucified and hanging on gibbets. I have seen brave warriors turned to cringing dogs. I know that you must feel it is hopeless to resist the masked men of the Dark Empire, but they can be beaten. I, myself, was one of the commanders of an army little more than a thousand strong that put an army of Grand Britain more than 20 times its number to flight. It was our will to live that enabled us to do it, our knowledge that even if we fled we would be hunted down and die eventually, ignobly. You can at least die courageously like men and know that there is a chance of defeating the forces that have taken your city today, dot, 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 dot. He spoke on in this vein and gradually the tired warriors rallied. 
It's like even Murcock can't be asked at this point. It's like, <laughs> he just oh. carried on imagining. He, yeah, it he, he spoke on this phone for a while, and eventually a couple went, "Yay!" And this is entirely how I feel about Murcock talking to me at this point. It's like Murcock is banging on in this vein for a while longer, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving it a half-hearted cheer and going, eh, oh. I mean, the self-awareness it takes to just go, "You ain't listening. I ain't listening." <laughs> Yeah, so the Queen says, we'll attack tonight, giving them no time to get wind of our plans. I'll ride with you, I think, said the warrior and Jane Gold. Well, thanks, mate. Um, you know, do what, do what you've got to do. See you tomorrow. So, back into Hammerdown, more fighting. And this, this, by this point, it hardly feels like the same Arthur anymore. When you read the, the descriptions of the action now compared to the descriptions of the action only three or four chapters ago, which was probably last night in real terms... He's, he's everything that has been taken has deserted him now. Hartman's got a banging headache from the Black Jewel. But lo, turns out Oladan nicked Agonosphos' helmet and tells Hartmoon, this helm has certain properties. There are circuits built into it. Blah, 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 blah. So all the way through this book, we've got mock-up descriptions of weird signs. And by the end, he's just like, oh yeah, this helmet's got some circuits in it. Works for me. Oh, God. Let me invent a whole pseudoscience of bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Let you for a page upon page. Yeah. No. No. It's, 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 just, it's, just, it's just got an old fucking Pentium motherboard in it. Look, you've Deal accepted he's got a jewel in his head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is the thing. I accept all that. I accept that the jewel doesn't record audio. It only shows video. I could deal with all that. But don't tell me about a helmet that's got some circuits in it. After all this, after buying into this world... Oladan produces this helmet out of his fucking pants that he, that he Hartman didn't realise he'd taken off Agonosphos and explains, oh yeah, there's some circuits in it which will block the action of the duel. It's like, fucking hell, man. You know, just just don't bother having the references to the duel getting more painful. It's, it's like, oh, it's so, it's pretty lame. Anyway, Hartman and Melidus go at it and we get this fight, which again, comparing it to the one-on-one from the Kamag versus Mikozovar, it's pretty disappointing. And it ends with Hartman passing out. He spoils <laughs> Melidus' good looks. Melidus howls with this big scar on his face. And then he's so knackered, he passes out. And we don't really find out what happens to Melidus. And he wakes up in bed. Queen Farabra has retaken the city. Melidus, they assume, is dead. And he says, oh, is Melidus dead? They say, yeah, yeah, we assume so. We didn't find his body, though. And then Hartman goes, yeah, I'm glad he's dead. But no, you're an idiot. So Malagigi sorts him out, Finally. The MacGuffin of the Black Jewel is finally sorted out by Magigi. Malagigi, who sorts him out and he captures the machine of the Black Jewel in a little box. And Hartmoon asks potentially what he could do in return. Well, says Malagigi, I've got an idea for book four. Yeah. Nay, nothing, Malagigi said, almost with a smirk. I am glad to have this machine here. He tapped the box. Perhaps it will be of use to me sometime. Besides, dot, 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 he frowned, staring thoughtfully at Hartman. What is it? Oh, nothing. So, yeah, potential set. Maybe, maybe we'll get a Malagigi spin-off. Fine. Malagigi in the, in the brain machine or something. Living hope. Yeah, so that could be important later on. Anyway, Warrior and Jet and Girl goes to sod off again, because basically all he does is turn up, sod off, turn up, sod off, sometimes within the space of a single page but not before acknowledging that he served the mysterious rune staff. And then and that Hartman probably does as well. And Hartman's like, mm, I'm not sure about that. Never yeah. heard of it. And all then goes, oh, the rune staff, mysterious, mm. legends. And then Queen Farabra, the hot chariot babe, offers to share Just the throne. Just a woman too, shall we? Yeah. 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 She offers to share the throne of smoking Hamadan with Hartman. So she's only known him about 35 seconds. He looks good mm. in that outfit. It, it must be, yeah, he must still be wearing his, uh, his Keanu Reeves outfit. Mm. But he goes, no, nah, the end. Thanks very much. The end of the duel in the Take skull. Take a hard pass on that one, bitch. What, what a roller coaster. What a rubbish roller coaster. Now, I'm not going to say parts one and two were rubbish because they were. Parts one and two were great. The world building was brilliant. Really love all the world building. Okay, Hartman's a bit of a downer. We have waxed lyrical on some of these descriptions, haven't we? We have. And, and I, th- I think if anybody listens to this in isolation, please, please, please listen to episodes one and two where we are, drunk. admittedly, considerably more drunk, 
But the episode A probably is going to be shorter because of what we've just said about the book. So, yeah. we'll, although I can tightly glass up, we'll see if we can make it more interesting for you guys. Yeah, we. It is definitely the case that this episode reflects one massive peak. It's, it's basically a single peak roller coaster. This episode, it's one big peak, like and a then a mad rush though. down, like a like a graph. Like a curve. Yeah. And we don't want to flatten the curve. We want to enjoy the ride. Surf that. No, unfortunately, it's one massive downhill fucking pile. From really? The peak. From, from, and there uh, isn't even a log flume. There isn't even any water at the bottom. It's just a, a gradual, leathery, dusty grind to What's a halt it? in Hammerdown. Do they just... Oh, is that the start of the next one? Am I jumping ahead? I think you may be jumping ahead. And, and it's, um, it is easily 25 years since I've read the rest of these. Well, I started on the next one thinking naively that would be done with this one and that yeah. you know like one book per podcast because it is in fact how many pages is it a decent sized print yeah. like we've spent how many hours is it now Andrew because you've listened to it over and over 156 yeah I think by the, by the time we're finished there'll be a good four hours talking about this one book yeah yeah and other things oh well um, I'm sure it's mostly this book. I can't imagine what else could have possibly come into mind. No, I don't think we discussed anything but this book and Absolutely. academic analysis of the themes within. Absolutely. Yeah. Objective as well. Yeah. Systematic. Whilst I think that book three of, of The Jew and the Skull is poor, and possibly among some of the poorest, more co- books <laughs> one and two are some of the best. The world building is brilliant. But what I have to acknowledge is that Moorcock was a massive, massive influence on things like Dungeons and Dragons and the people who wrote Dungeons and Dragons. And the stuff that I think Which is I've never the, played. Yeah. And the stuff that I think is the weakest actually is a classic example of why Moorcock was such a huge influence on D D. Because D D is entirely set up for travel, encounter, fight, booty, magic items, repeat until final fight. Rinse and repeat. And that's basically what D D has been built on for forty plus years. And that is essentially book three of the Jew and the Skull. It is like it is like uh, a D and D game, and many fantasy books. Yeah, many many Eddings, Gemmel, all of those yeah. guys did yeah. series after series of the exact same formula, just with a lot more talking. Yeah, a lot more meals. Yeah. So for the reasons that it irritates you, I really fucking love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that it's it's unashamedly like. Pop trash. Yeah. Sit on the toilet. You could probably, you could probably. My mother's never gonna hear. You could probably read it in one shit. She'll be, she'll be praying till oh. the day she dies if you found out. I said book that three. Book. Undoubtedly, had I not been reading it and making notes for this, I could have read that in one visit to the throne. So, so what I like about it, so the the way it's received is the way he sent it, and, and I like that. I, yeah. I like that. You know, you're you both in the same state. I like that. You know, he clearly can't be asked, but he knows you can't be asked, and none of us can be asked. Yeah. and this is the beginning of a long thing so instead of mincing it out and going I don't know describing the gray of the gray behind the gray and that's just the clouds and then when you look at the towers and that's just shades of gray followed yeah. by the shades of gray of the streets and the people and the mood of the people and yeah 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 literature fine but if you can't be asked don't don't fake it you've yeah. already made it. We still went out both you and I and ate the next X amount of books off the back of that yeah. and as you say it is a roller coaster but that's the thing because you have to skim bits because you know like I say I don't read word for word battle scenes but yeah. also you have to stay slightly mindful about the little gems of descriptions you even get dotted in and as we've just discussed you know it might have been blah 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 rally the troops dot 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 and he went on yeah but it was still funny. Yeah. It's actually, it's quite a subtle joke. In a, It's much better than reading a page and a half of why they should rally for... Who the fuck he is to talk to them? He's literally just arrived. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's mine, <laughs> isn't it? They've got the, uh, they've got the power. That yeah, is a reading of the, that uh, that I hadn't actually considered. Is what, the, woman the... 2 had nothing to offer yeah. as their queen of, of long-standing, who they've already been, what, fighting for and lost the city to. But, yeah. So... But here's my new boy toy. Doesn't he look handsome? Yeah. So is, is it your contention, then? That that bit where Hawkmoon is tiredly trying to rally the troops of Queen Farabra and it says he continued in this vein for a while, that Moorcock has firmly got his tongue in his cheek as he's writing that and going, and he just bangs on at them for a bit and then they go, hey. I'm not, I'm not an English teacher, so I wouldn't possibly dream of imagining what state of plane of yeah. existence Moorcock. I think he was wearing his underpants on his head by that point. 
and he probably had a cigarette up each nose and you know someone was spoon feeding him I mean what year was it that this was 67 I think 67 oh 69 yeah Yeah. oh no copyright 67 right so acid and speed yeah so yeah it was probably up to his ears in crushed up speed tablets with Lemmy you know up until a couple of days before the publishers rung up and said do us a favour Mike knock us some books out we're a bit short of of readies it was like, yeah, no problem. Got himself a number of heroic doses lined up. And then by the end of those three days, he's probably in the ba- in a cold bath trying to keep himself awake with a typewriter on on a, a table next to him, just trying to get to the end of the shit. I would like to imagine when he did the dot, 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 and he went on, oh, I like that, to think he giggled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he could have been literally shitting his own pants at yeah. the time. And, and I think that's up to him. That's yeah. the great thing about... The, the art and the artist and how you have to separate the product from the person. Yeah. Christ, you'd never like anything, would you? Well, you know what? E- even though I've been somewhat critical of it, and I am now thinking about your reading of that and stroking my chin thinking, mm, maybe there's something to that. Maybe there's something a little bit subversive and transgressive about about him doing that, especially with the memory that really all there was before this was Fritz Lieber, Farford and the Grey Mouse, Mouse of Stories, and there was Conan Stories, and... Really not a whole lot else when it came to just to really lightweight fantasy sword and sorcery type action. Maybe maybe it is it's either he's just fucking knackered and he's gotta yeah. he's gotta bang this shit out. Or he's knackered and he's banging the shit out with his tongue in his cheek by this point. Or this is a deliberate ploy all along to set up the rationale for forty plus years of, of role playing games and LARPing. Who knows? It could it could be a combination of all three potentially. So, so you think? I mean, I don't. I, do you know that might be a stretch beyond what I was prepared to accept? Is the idea that this this was a cunning plan? <laughs> <laughs> I think the pencils up in those ideas probably a bit more more close to it. Yeah. The, the, the accidental impact that it's had on the you know the genre. Yeah. Um, and again, the fact that, as you say, you're bitching about it, I actually think I've read, for example, The Wheel of Fucking Time. That was that exact, what, yeah. 40 pages yeah. over weeks of my life, literally weeks of my life I will never get back yeah. from, oh, let's go here, let's find that, let's go here, let's find that. Oh, you're such a hero. Oh, mm-hmm. rally the troops. You know, just all of it um, over and over and over, wash, rinse, repeat, and it's tedious. And the fact that he's done it yeah. um, and then people have copied it, and made an absolute mint, but he should have trademarked them. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, certain other things that don't really... The Hawk Moon books are unusual for this Eternal Champion stuff because they don't include the Gods of Law and Chaos, which are all over all the other stuff. And um, Games Workshop have already wholesale ripped off all of the Law and Chaos stuff, the symbology of it, everything to do with it, even to the point where, and I don't know if this is actually the case, but whether it's a rumour or it's actual fact, Games Workshop actually tried to copyright the chaos symbol mm-hmm. because it's all over their stuff. But Mocock came up with that. But Games Workshop do have a, a habit of doing this type of thing. They tried to copyright the word Space Marine. Wow. Yeah, and, right. and issued cease and desist orders to people who used Space Marine in things like novels and other bits and pieces. No, we own that. We own that terminology. So they've, they've certainly got form for doing it. Well, like the brew dog of the gaming world. I did wonder if we were going to mention brew dog. And you know, the next thing that popped into my head is, you know, like guys write into Andrew because he's available online um, if you're interested. Is we should have a uh, what's a drinks review because actually I think I, I do wonder in certain chapters whether what we're drinking is slightly more interesting. Yeah. than what we're discussing. And I think also yeah. what we're drinking at that specific moment probably has as much of an influence of what we end up talking about as the actual thing that Absolutely. we're reading. Absolutely. So I'm saying we do the opposite of what I just said fantasy show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying we do the, the wine, food and fantasy show. Yeah. Um, you know, not not like the full, what was it, four months of everything we've eaten and drank since the last time we discussed it. But yeah. Today... It's, it's interesting actually that you bring up the Wheel of Time because um, someone I know, a friend of Gemma's called Lauren. Uh-huh. Um, she... We were sitting at Saltair Festival last year and she mentioned that she'd love to do a Wheel of Time podcast. And uh, the first thing I thought was, fucking hell, them books are about 8 million pages long. Just one of them. They never end. Yeah. Never, ever, ever, yeah. ever. So d- doing a podcast about Wheel of Time would probably, you'd have to do it slightly differently to how we do it. Doing 60 pages for, per episode, <laughs> which, is, which is roughly what we're doing at the moment. 
Um, I don't think we've gone particularly beyond 60 pages per episode. I think it kill us. I mean, I don't think either of us could afford... We would afford, have to give up work. Well, we couldn't afford the alcohol. Yeah. And I think we'd need some sort of kidney dialysis machine. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm, I'll give it a go. But I don't want to read it again, Jesus. I, I can't. The fact that I read it once... And I mean, for somebody who's been married twice... I don't actually have as many regrets as you might imagine in no. my life, but that is one thing. If I could go back and delete something that I've done, mm. probably, and you'd be surprised, you might think it would be episode two of this podcast, yeah. but it was actually... <laughs> it was actually you know, that's out there posterity now. Yeah, and, but that was three hours. Even if I doing this, I, say, that, this I will continue weeks. to pay hosting fees just to keep episode two out there, just so people can rediscover it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I promise. I'll rediscover that conversation one day, maybe when. <laughs> no, after having that conversation at, uh, at Salt Air with Lauren, I, I thought, right, after all these years of people saying the Wheel of Time novels are good or bad or indifferent, and I know we'd had a conversation about the Wheel of Time at one point, and knowing the fact that kind of Dune style, the author dies before he finishes. I'm not surprised. Yeah. I think that's probably what made him give up on life. Yeah. Even then. I actually picked up the first three from a charity shop and I tried reading the first one. Oh, fuck that. Mate, it, the it, first it, three are the best three. I think <laughs> it, goes, it goes on for another 20. Yeah, <laughs> so no. If you didn't like book one, you're not going to like book nine. You know, when, when I read 30 or 40 pages or something and I get to the end of those 30 or 40 pages and I think, I haven't got a fucking clue what I've just read and I haven't taken any of it in. I've just been reading the words... And they might as well have just been hitting my brain and falling out my nose. I was like, yeah, that's not working for me. That, I'm sure that's what killed the author. Yeah. But I think it was Brandon. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure we've discussed this, but I don't want to, I don't want to be so vain as to listen to my own conversation in case mm. I said something interesting. Yeah. Um, but Brandon Sanderson, who took over, essentially has built a career exactly on the format that we've just read in the last 40 pages. Right. Absolutely. He is, he is so classic formulaic. However, he's inoffensive. He is, He's probably the modern Moorcock, except he's, he's consistently average, but he, he churns them out, you know, mm. sort of Mills and Boone style of a certain size that yeah. you can't be angry at, you know, well, yeah. you can if you want to care about quality. But it's, I thought so, that but, I'm jealous. I'd love to make a living doing that. Absolutely. I, I yeah. mean, I again, I've written nothing, Brandon, so thanks very much. I have read several of your books and paid for them. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not, I ain't pissing on you. I'm just yeah. saying, you know, it's, it's, it's the modern Moorcock. But anyway, so he's the one who finished... I'm assuming it's fucking finished Wheel of Time, but what I would love, and if you haven't finished it, this is what I'd love to have happen. Like the last page, just a big spaceship turns up and just <laughs> nukes the fucking planet. Like, and all this, also what it's described as like a dot appeared in the sky and then a yeah. big flame and then everything just blew up. Because I think that is, that is the length and breadth of my personal interest in any weft or weave yeah. of that fucking tapestry. Mm. That's um, not far off the end of the stand. It's not a spaceship, it's the hand of God in the stand. But, uh-huh. it's, but it's basically like, you know, you read a thousand pages and then it's, it all climaxes with, and then the hand of God sorted it out. Yeah. Like, Feistad one Never of those read a Stephen moments. King book again after that. Yeah, Feist had one of those moments. He Bless wasted so But then he is getting wasted on. Wasted hours on that fucking book. Yeah, like book 28, and like now there's a there's a army of angels. Yeah. And then I think they got eaten. Mm. Like, what? <laughs> I, just, I, I barely hope that it, it was and uh, I think they got eaten that would be perfect. seriously like it's like oh then there's like oh there was all this that was going on behind all that uh, bless him that the same character gets recycled but yeah. not an eternal champion just the same name of the same family who just yeah. happens to have the exact same traits over and over bless yeah. I read his books bought his books would have still been reading his books if he could be bothered to I think we've said before, proofread them. Yeah. That's where I draw the line. But yeah, this this horde of angels, like book 26 or something, mm. and then and then they just get eaten. Yeah. And I'm like, well, A, where did they come from? And then what, ate it? And then are you going to close this off in your final book when we haven't even met? Anyway. Yeah. So we've reached the end of Julian this call. There's, there's a few, have we? Yeah, there's a few questions. It's true. Talk. It's true. Is it real? You don't have to read it again. You're not lying to yeah, me. You don't have to read it again. I was convinced we'd done it last time. Yeah. Most disappointed no, the, to find the, we hadn't. The, the trauma is over for now. Uh, but there are a couple of crucial questions we need to address. And, and the first is, we need to hop on Lord Shark's ostentatious couch, which on this occasion is um, just a couple of old breeze blocks and planks covered in slugs. But don't worry. We're going to pop on Lord Shark's ostentatious couch and we're going to cast Hawkmoon, the series, for the BBC. Woman 1, Woman 2, Tom yeah. Cruise. 
Yeah. Clearly, yeah. So we've, we've already got, yeah, we've already got Keanu Reeves yes. as uh, as a stand-in for Peter Wingard yes. who's dead for Malaitis. Right. So, so we can't have dead actors. No. Well, I, we could do fancy casting, but let's let's try and give the BBC something to work with. So find some fucking money, BBC, and get Keanu Reeves and get him a Peter Wingard tash and haircut and get him in the black leathers as Malaitis. Just, just get him in the black leathers. Get him in the black leathers. Post pictures. You yeah. can crowdfund it. I think Count Brass needs to be that tall ginger bloke out of Game of Thrones. I would personally, um, I would like to see Brian Blessed play Bojentle. Brian Blessed is Bojentle. Now that would work. That would be awesome. Yeah, because he's, he's, he's too old and too far gone to play, to play the Count. But yeah, get him in as Bojentle. Because when he does his four pages of beat poetry... <laughs> That's what it's made for. We would, <laughs> yeah. we would edit out nothing, nothing. That'd just be one whole episode. Yeah. Of the bright and blessed doing beat poetry. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm on board with that. Excellent. So we've got Bo Gentle. We've got Count Brass potentially, even though you don't know what I'm talking about. Now, the tough one is Hawk Moon. What actors are out there who are sufficiently blank personality wise? Cumberbatch. He can no, be. He's yeah, an, but he's in everything. I know, but that is blind. He's, and he overacts. He, he'll be. He'll be Sherlock in all of them. No, he overacts too I was, much. I was I think, clearly joking. Yeah, I think um, you'd need someone like uh, the the guy who plays Thor. Oh yeah, he's pretty blind, isn't he? Yeah, he's pretty blind. That yeah. kind of that kind of homogenous, square chin, flat faced kind of allegedly, yeah, panty wetting kind of yeah hunk. Because that's going to be what made the Queen, you know, hand over her entire army to a guy who just turned up yeah. asked her for a favour. I'm sure we'll get all these guys on the BBC budget. Yeah. BBC World will do it. Yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. So listen to us, BBC. We've cast it for you. We've done half the work for you, so no problem there. So a serious question number two is, we're covering Mocock books and we're podcasting Mocock books. You haven't told me who Cam Brass is yet. Um, oh, that guy out of Game of Thrones. Ah. Oh. He's, he's naturally red-headed. He's got an impressive beard. Ooh, it's terrifying. Oh, what's that, that that for, that's Count Brass for me. He's a good actor as well. He's a bit younger than I'd pictured him. Yeah, but I, I could see him having an 18-year-old daughter. Count Brass doesn't have to be 50 or 60. I think oh. he just needs to be, you know, middle-aged. I think, he, I think he'd do a good job. Yeah, I, I think I agree with I like you. him, and he's, he's, he's a natural redhead, he's got a beard, he carries it off well, and he's also extremely tall, he's about six foot two, six foot three. Excellent. So he could carry that off quite nicely. We'll fix and it. his name is <clears throat> something Christopher Hivju. So I, I'd quite happily have him as, as Count Brass. So next question. We've been podcasting about Michael Mocock books, and we've talked about the folly that would be to podcast about Wheel of Time books. If we were to podcast about another book as a break from Mocock, what would you choose? Me. Mm. <clears throat> something that you've already read. No, no, something potentially that you would say, read this and let's podcast about it. Oh. Oh. Mm. Oh. Can think... maybe come back to that one? Have a think well, about I, it. I can think of several things, but I think you should do a poll because the thing is, are we going to stick with fantasy or do we do something? Anything from your formative years that were in the same way for me formative as Mocock was. Right. So it would be your choice. My mother used to buy me, and I don't know why. Presumably she thought it put me off Men for Life. Barbara Cartland books. Wow. You and and I would get a pack of them at Christmas, which is probably why I like the size of book. <clears throat> and, and it starts like this. Woman one, daughter of rich bloke, told she needs to marry some bloke. Runs away, meets a bloke in a forest. He always thinks she's a wood nymph. Mm. There must have been a lot of wood nymphs around. He takes her in, she stays with him, because that's what happened. Uh, but all legit, obviously. Falls in love, realizes he's the bloke she needs to marry. Yeah. Marries him. Uh, every single fucking book, right. and I read a lot of them. I wouldn't put either of us through that again, even just thinking about it being quite traumatic. Okay, well, I, I will. I am inwardly see, sign, uh, sign uh, get it out of that. Uh, get, get Have you read any Christopher Brookmeyer? No, I, th- I think what we need to do is uh, we've talked about Mercedes Lackey, we've talked about Edding. You've mentioned Christopher Brookmeyer before. Mm-hmm. I think you need to come up with three books that potentially we could give some thoughts of podcasting about. Can we put it out to the? Um, yes, I was going to say we'll yeah. see what people vote on because hmm. you're like speaking to the outside. Hmm. Hello, yeah. outside. Yeah. And the last question before we finish is: Are we finishing? Is that it? Well. This could go on for hours, obviously, but we've got to draw it to a halt at some point. Last question for, for this show, so it's, so, it's, so it's not two hours long, is we'll finish the jewel in the Skull 
would your preference be for the next time we do this, when we stick to Mocock, to go on to Madgov's Amulet or something else? Ooh. Well, we have a... What have you got in your Mocock pile? We've got um, we've got a Behold the Man plan, mm-hmm. haven't we? We have got a Behold the Man plan, but I think I think the intention is to do that as some kind of panel. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I'll leave you with some homework then. Right, three Take books. Take a look. Yeah, so three books that aren't Mocock to put out to a poll. And Because the thing with starting with an book? Eddings is you're on another 900 pages, aren't you? Yeah. They're not on Mocock. On the caveat, must not be 900 pages long. Yeah, don't want to yeah. overcommit you. Yeah. Give it some thought. Do you know, there's an interesting... I mean, if I, people want to comment, because you guys will probably get this turned around before I've made any kind of decision. Yeah. Um, so in the 90s, I was reading some uh, cyberpunk by Jeff Noon, yeah. which was, I thought it was, like everything at the time, I always thought it was dystopian. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realise that one person's dystopia was another person's utopia. Yeah. Um, yeah, I never read any Jeff Noon. I read William Gibson. And I read, I read George some William Alec Gibson. I didn't. Effinger. To be fair, when I was talking about the grey on grey, that's yeah. I think the start of necromancer. That just made me think, oh, get fucked. Yeah, the, the start of necromancer now would make no sense to people less than twenty five years old <laughs> because it starts with the sky was tuned to the colour of a dead TV channel, <laughs> meaning static. Whereas, so you're loving it. Whereas I remember the reading it started reading it going, ah, oh, fuck. Well, no, I, I, I remember that distinctly because I always thought it was it, it was a good line. But I, I'm also completely aware of the fact that dead TV channels now are just blue. There is no such thing as static on televisions anymore. A, so someone reading that now would go, what, the sky was tuned to the colour of a dead TV channel. So go, oh, it was blue. blue. It was a really nice blue. <laughs> gorgeous, it was gorgeous, gorgeous blue trough sky. on summer's day. Yeah. I wonder if you'll update it. You'll leave the word Negro in it, but it will change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, change that. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, so you've got your homework. I'm thinking about the homework, but yes, Jeff Noon you might find interesting because he had driverless cars that were blacked out and computer controlled and people lost connection to where they were because they never saw where they were. And as as the sat-nav has crept in and now the electric cars and the driverless cars Mm. creep in and the the quarantine ghettos or the the areas that are no good car access and, you know, just forget they're there because a bit like those, um, if you remember the old Mark Thomas TV product, I think, where he's doing the... So it works exit only, yeah. um, and off all these works exits that used to be places. That's where all these detention centres magically sprang up, and you know, and it's it's that sort of hidden history. And I just think, you know, contextually, yeah. I feel like rereading it. So that was the nineties, okay. still slightly fantasy, but there were standalone novels. Yeah, but it was a bit again. If you don't do drugs, the kind of things. And again, it's that. So if something you was reading at fourteen when I probably wasn't doing drugs. Yeah. Um, well, it's up to you. We'll have to but think back. Because I'm busting for a piss, I'm going to recap your homework and then I'm going to draw it to a close. So your homework is three non mocock books to put out to a vote that aren't 900 pages long. Why? That were from your formative years. And let me know what you feel like covering next. It could be the Mad God's Amulet or it could be something else more. Ask the guys. Right, I'm going to draw this to a close. So Thank thanks you. as always, Tash, for your input and your amazing grub and the rum. It's always a winner. And we'll see you all next time. So finally, another book concluded. Thanks as ever to Tash for the great food and rum. And we'll have a good long think about what Tash does next as we're keen to spread the aspect of the Eternal Champion around a bit and get some different takes. Speaking of which, our latest patron, my old mucker Robbo, drew some comparisons between Moorcock and Philip K. Dick that are absolutely fair. He sent me this. Listening to the Eternal Champion episode, I think Moorcock was influenced by Philip K. Dick a lot with the who am I, what is real angle of the multiple characters. He's referenced him as an influence, I think. Yeah, Robbo, there is some truth to that. Moorcock said in an interview a few years back in The Guardian, I found Dick by happy coincidence. In 1959, we both appeared in the magazine New Worlds. My story, Peace on Earth, written with Barrington Bailey under the joint pseudonym Michael Barrington, alongside Time Out of Joint, which was serialised over three issues. It had a pretty standard SF plot, but Dick's ideas hooked me. Later, with other enthusiasts, I helped Dick find prestigious publishers, such as Penguin and Cape, leading to his early literary acceptance in England long before he was widely respected in the US. Robbo added, 
That makes sense. A lot of speed-induced paranoia in PKD's stuff. He was around some incredible influences at the time. Also, Mocock was a child who would have wandered bomb-battered London post the war and its aftermath. The adults traumatised by it in his childhood world seemed to be huge influences too. He was born into a world of chaos, threat and the aftermath of its dictators. The leaders of surety which cost the lives of millions. All his characters are flawed, a warning against surety. Count Brass is a fool. He's Chamberlain the appeaser at the start. He nearly loses his daughter and ignores the obvious demon in the room despite plenty of warnings. He's almost victim of his own narcissism. I am strong and powerful, see the bullfight in brackets, and have good intentions so I know best. Melidas plays his narcissism and nearly gets his daughter as a cost. Mocock is constantly warning against the terror of following without question. It ends badly. That's a good reading of the situation, Mr Robinson. If any of you had been that astute when you were scrawling all sorts of gubbins all over my Garfield pencil case back in the day, instead of paying attention to Mr Crone and his wacky hair wings. Anyway, cheers Robbo, and thanks again for joining us as a patron. And thanks, as always, to Tom, Malpertwee, David, Matt, Simon, Jim, Fred, and our very own Lord of the Higher Plains, Norman. I'm still super stoked to have all of your support. Also, Fred, our very best wishes to you right now. You're such a warm and positive presence and we're beaming that warmth and positivity right back at you at the moment. Also, thanks to all those friends of the show out there on Twitter who listen and give their thoughts and feedback. We'll have a few of those to share on the final part of the Eternal Champion in a few weeks. We are at Breakfast Ruins on Twitter and Instagram. The website and blog is breakfastintheruins.com and if you want to drop us an old-fashioned email you can get us on breakfastruins at outlook.com. But, in the immortal words of Marty DeBerge, enough of my yakking. Sit back listen to the melodies and dulcet tones of Giant Kind and Breakfast in the Ruins, and I'll catch you next time on the Moonbeam Roads. I teed a mirror brink behind this chair A blank abyss, it's moving It's crumbling I think I can ignore this God damn it, I nearly spilled my drink The city has gone Followed the milk down the brink A chain of hands to stop the A chain of hands to stop the falling The food's long coming But there's no one to complain to People are few But I'm one
Nothing can bother me I love the taste The taste of apathy A chain of hands to stop the fall 